Now that we're in October, I'd like to welcome you all to Mentoctober Part 4, the final chapter. Yes, this time of year I release a series of videos to fit the theme of Halloween, and it's time to begin our descent into the Super Mario rabbit hole again as I explore the origins of the Koopa King, Bowser. We know this is an arch nemesis of the famous Super Mario, who's still getting another video once October's over, but for now, let's head back in time and see what we can uncover about this classic villain. So as I discussed in the first Mario origin video, Mario has had quite a few appearances before Nintendo finally settled into the Super Mario Bros series. The first Super Mario Bros game released in 1985 for the Nintendo Entertainment System and would debut Mario's transition into an action platformer, pitting him against the great demon King Koopa, who has kidnapped Princess Toadstool of the Mushroom Kingdom. The name Bowser is actually his localized name for Western audiences, with his name simply being Koopa in Japan, which oddly enough was the name that they went with in the famous 1993 live action adaptation, considering they changed everything else. King Koopa here. Oh, yes sir. I'd like the Koopa special. Pterodactyl tail on that? Yes. Dino, lizard, Hold the mammal, no worms, and uh, spicy. Anyway, we're introduced to Bowser as the leader of the Koopas, who use their black magic to transform the people of the Mushroom Kingdom into stones, bricks, and field horsehair plants, objects that we see scattered throughout the game. And I'm gonna assume that the Magic Koopas or Kamek were behind this, even if they didn't debut these enemies until Super Mario World. But seeing as they can transform blocks into enemies, I'll assume they can do the opposite. So Mario has to save the princess from Bowser so she can undo the spell on the Mushroom People, and as I'm talking about it, I would love to see Nintendo just remake the first game to address all this lore. I know we're tired of remakes and video games at this point, but I need Mario and Sonic to straighten out their backstories. Why does it exist? Who asked for this? Who said yes? Who needs to be held responsible? So as Mario tears through each world, you have to brave one of Bowser's castles in the fourth level of each world, fighting him on a bridge over hot lava at the end of each castle. And what I never noticed is that all Bowsers you take on before World 8 are actually fake Bowsers. Yeah, every king needs some decoys out there, I guess, and I'm surprised Princess Peach has never tried this, seeing how often she gets kidnapped. But all that aside, the developers implemented this idea by accident when one of the programmers mistakenly inserted an upside-down Koopa Trooper shell when Bowser was initially defeated. They ended up liking this idea of him having stand-ins instead, and the idea stuck. So if you take him out with a fire flower, you'll see the enemy that was transformed turn back to normal before falling off screen. Normally I just beat this by taking down the bridge instead, which is probably why I never noticed, cause you won't see the enemy turn back to normal when you take that route. Anyway, once Mario defeats the real Bowser at the end of the game, this character is solidified as his main arch nemesis, returning for every mainline Super Mario title from that point on, except the US version of Super Mario Bros 2, but that's a different story entirely. But what exactly are Koopas? So when Super Mario Bros was initially localized, the Western translations mistook the name Koopa as the name of the entire tribe that Bowser commands, and from that point on they used the name to collectively refer to these turtles. But in Japan they are known as Kame Ichizoku, which roughly translates to the turtle tribe. So of course, most of the enemies that Mario faces in this series are part of the Koopa tribe, with different types of Koopa serving different purposes. And just to add to this confusion, Koopa is only used to refer to Bowser in Japan as well. So all the localized versions that we see here is a result of those initial mistranslations. Anyway, the most common Koopas that we see are the Koopa Troopas, but there are others such as Boom Boom, <gasps> Hammer Bros, Lucky Twos, and Yoshis? No way! Yeah, this is true. Yoshis can be considered Koopas, but I gotta leave something interesting for my eventual Yoshi video. So we'll get to that some other time. But Bowser seems to be a part of his own species of Koopa, with most of the members of his lineage being considered part of a royal family. But sit tight, before we get to his royal bloodline, we gotta check out what our boy Miyamoto was thinking when he came up with Bowser as a villain. When I start getting sponsors, this is probably the section where I'd talk to you about Rage Shadow Legends, but you know, we're not there yet, so moving along. This is the earliest known concept art for Bowser, which looks a lot like a normal Koopa Troopa. And during this phase, Miyamoto would name him Boss Creeper, derived from the name Shell Creeper, one of the turtle enemies that we see running around the sewers of New York in the Mario Bros game. But the name Boss Creeper didn't stick around for long, as they came up with three other possible names. Koopa, Yuke, and Bibimba. Bibimba? Bibimba. 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 Baby Bop. 
Mm, yes. Which are the Japanese pronunciations of popular Korean dishes. Due to the time constraints, Miyamoto would go on to draw the box art for Super Mario Bros. himself, depicting Bowser with grayish skin instead. And I would honestly love for this to become a totally different enemy in a future Mario game. Who asked for this? Just thinking out loud here, Nintendo. Miyamoto drew some inspiration for the character from the antagonist Ox Demon King from the anime adaptation of Journey to the West, hence some of his features loosely resembling an ox. If you're not familiar with Journey to the West, that's an old Chinese tale that's very popular in Japanese culture and influenced a lot of characters and plot themes in anime and games alike, the most popular version of this being Dragon Ball. It wasn't until further discussion and involvement from other artists that they would fully plan out Bowser's final design for the Mario series, with them going fully turtle based on the features of the Koopa Troopas that already existed. So their main artist, Yoichi Kotabe, decided to take inspiration from an aggressive species of turtle, the Chinese softshell turtle. Ah! Oh! Whoa! Whoa! I'm not seeing the resemblance. But apparently this asshole of a turtle is what was used to create the Bowser that we know today. And we see that Bowser has ruled over the Koopas from the earliest point in the Mario timeline with a baby version of himself being featured in Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island. This game still remains as the earliest Mario game chronologically, unless otherwise stated, with Baby Bowser serving as the main antagonist and final boss. Yoshi serves as the babysitter for Baby Mario for a majority of the game, as he and the other Yoshis attempt to save his brother Luigi and get both children safely back on their way to their parents via this stork that was also kidnapped. And on the other hand, Kamekir serves as Baby Bowser's caretaker, and is the cause of most of the mishaps in this game in the first place. Kidnapping Luigi and the Stork since he foresees the Mario Brothers becoming a problem for them later on. And boy was Kamek here right, way ahead of his time. Also in this game we see baby Bowser at the very end wanting to ride the green donkey before it transitions into the final boss fight which serves as Mario and Bowser's very first scrap. Yoshi and Mario are victorious with Kamek and baby Bowser flying off to fight another day. We'd see them again in Yoshi's Island DS, where a bunch of babies from the Mushroom Kingdom are kidnapped by Bowser from the future. His plan is to find the seven star children and use their power to become the ruler of this universe. So these children include, of course, Baby Mario, Luigi, Peach, DK, Wario, Bowser, and a newborn Yoshi. This game honestly doesn't make much sense continuity-wise, but Bowser isn't even kind to his past self which ends up with baby Bowser joining Yoshi and the rest of the babies to stop Bowser. You'd think you'd remember the moment where your older self came back from the future and terrorized you so you would stop yourself from doing it in the future. Man, f them kids, bro. Anyway, so once they get back to Bowser's castle, baby Bowser gets into a little spat with Wario who wants his treasure, which causes some friction amongst the babies. So baby Bowser turns on them and stays with Kamek and his future self instead, while the other babies square up with a future Bowser and try to stop him from kidnapping all of the babies again. Which brings into question Bowser's lineage. Is he a straight up orphan in this game with Kamek biding their time until he's a fully grown king? Well, while Nintendo doesn't seem to want to discuss this much, I did manage to track down one time where this is addressed. Nintendo had a comic book series published back in the 90s called Nintendo Comics System, overseen by Valiant Comics. And these books had several shorts that included popular Nintendo characters from series like Donkey Kong, Mario, and The Legend of Zelda. In one particular issue known as Bedtime for Drainhead, Bowser kidnaps Toad at the beginning of the comic and mentions to Toad that he hopes to see his father on Kingdom's Most Wanted a television program in their world. Now I know this is probably a throwaway line for the writers of this comic, but it does imply that his father is on the run, which depending on when this happened exactly could totally fit into the lore of the games if Nintendo wanted to go that route. I'm just saying Nintendo, I would love to see a game about the Bowser family reunion. Who asked? We also see Bowser's mother in some non-canon material like the Super Mario Bros. Super Show that ran back in 1989. And much like Dr. Robotnik's mom in the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, they just took Bowser and put a wig, dress, and heels on her and called her his mother. But we also see a tiny cameo of Bowser's mother as a librarian in the PC version of Mario's Time Machine Deluxe. I'm Bowser's mother and the librarian of this magnificent library. Bowser has been spending a lot of time here lately. I hope you find something of interest. Cool. So those are the only mentions of Bowser's parents, but did you all know that he's also implied to have a brother? No. Or he was, since Nintendo and Miyamoto love to flip-flop when it comes to the details about the Mario series. 
So in Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels, aka Super Mario Bros. 2 in Japan, you take on a color swap Bowser imposter in level 84. He has a bluish color instead of green, but also throws hammers and breathes fire, much like the real Bowser boss fight in the original Super Mario Bros. And if you defeat him with fireballs, he just dies as is. No minions, no stand-ins. So whoever this guy is, this is definitely his true form. The identity of this particular fake Bowser seems to have caused Nintendo some stress, since there are multiple ways he's been described. Like in the original Japanese guide for Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels, this blue Bowser is only referred to as a fake. But in other books released in the 90s that had direct collaboration with Nintendo, like the complete Super Mario Great Encyclopedia, roughly translated, the same fake Bowser is called the first of Bowser's brothers. In another book called the Super Mario Bros. Daizukan, or Great Picture Book, it states, In Mario 2, Bowser's little brother was a strong enemy who had the same strength as Bowser's body doubles. Now, based on all this material, it's hard to figure out who came up with this idea first, or if this was the original intention for this fake by Nintendo themselves, but this entire color swap was completely removed when Super Mario All-Stars version of the original games were released for the Super Nintendo, swapping the estranged brother out with the real Bowser instead. And I'd like to think that since we never saw this version of Bowser again, Mario literally murdered Bowser's brother in Super Mario Bros. 2 for Japan. I mean, what other explanation could there be? And then maybe Nintendo of Japan just didn't like the implications and just removed the idea of Bowser having a brother in the first place. I'm just thinking out loud here. I could go on and on about Bowser's supposed family, like the Koopalings, who were definitely introduced originally as his children, until Miyamoto-san said he wasn't down for that anymore. Probably because it brought with it too many questions about Bowser that he didn't want to address. So now they're officially just a set of Bowser's minions and nothing else with Miyamoto stating in a 2012 interview that the current story is that the seven Koopalings are not Bowser's children. So funny enough, in Smash 4, when you activate Palutena's guidance as Pit, they mention the relationship between them and Bowser being a mystery. The relationship between Bowser and the Koopalings is a real mystery. I kind of feel bad for them. That's sweet of you, but not very conducive to taking them down, Pit. And I'd like to think that Sakurai himself joking around with Miyamoto about not having any idea what the Koopalings are supposed to be. Anyway, as of 2022, Bowser has one child, and his name is Bowser Jr., first appearing in Super Mario Sunshine released for the Nintendo GameCube in 2002. Okay, so let's get back to Bowser himself. We'd see Bowser pretty much serving as the antagonist for the mainline games, kidnapping the princess and picking fights with Mario with his latest and greatest plan. It doesn't really get more complex than that, but I will have to mention his role in most of the Mario RPG games that we've gotten over the years, and I'd argue his more charming qualities were derived from the writing in those particular games. The very first time we see this is in the famous Super Mario RPG, Legend of the Seven Stars for the Super Nintendo. And for once, a new antagonist steps up to the plate, named Smithy, who at the very beginning of the game takes over Bowser's castle that would serve as his base of operations. As Mario ventures to collect the seven stars to defeat Smithy and his men, he would in fact run into Bowser, who wants to reclaim his castle, and Bowser does the unthinkable in the process, teams up with Mario for the very first time. Yeah, so this was unheard of at the time, which honestly one of the reasons why Super Mario RPG was so cool is we get to see Bowser from another perspective. And he also gives the player the middle finger after winning each battle, so that's awesome. But don't worry, that was changed in the US version, so us American kids missed out on that. We'd continue to see Nintendo explore Bowser's character even further with other story-driven Mario games like the Mario & Luigi series and Paper Mario, but if you truly want a game that explores this character, look no further than Mario & Luigi Bowser's Inside Story. This game originally released for the Nintendo DS back in 2009, but since then we got an enhanced version released for the 3DS, which even includes a Bowser Jr. side story. And I can only hope we get a similar game that puts Bowser in the spotlight again. While the plot doesn't dive into Bowser's origins or anything like that, I wanted to mention it since you get to experience the entire plot with Bowser as the protagonist. After being tricked into eating a vacuum shroom by the antagonist of the game, Fawful, Bowser swallows everything in sight while at Peach's castle. And this has Mario and Luigi, unbeknownst by Bowser, stuck inside his body for a majority of the game. The brothers will have to manipulate parts of his body to keep Bowser alive in dangerous situations while he goes after Fawful. And plot aside, we experience the whole story as Bowser and get to see a day in the life from his perspective. And I think this is one of the best written versions of Bowser out there, as we get to see how he runs his kingdom 
and the extent of his power. Alright, so what other versions of Bowser are out there? Well, aside from the games, there's a ton of media for Mario, like a long-running manga called Mario-kun, a few anime adaptations, and a few cartoons from the late 80s and early 90s with different versions of the character. And while Bowser is involved with many of these, I wanted to highlight a few that would do something with the character other than just being a villain. We'll save the other media for the Mario Part 2 video coming to my channel after months of stalling. The lie detective determined that was a lie. But first is a Japanese exclusive anime film from 1986 called Super Mario Bros. Peach Hime Kyushutsu Dai Saksen, which translates roughly to The Great Mission to Rescue Princess Peach. This would be another interpretation of the original game, but the first issue I have to point out is that they gave Peach a fiance. Unacceptable. Anyway, a VHS of this one hour special is actually one of the rarest pieces of Mario merchandise out there which not only stars Toru Furuya as Mario, who is famous for playing Tuxedo Mask from Sailor Moon and Sabo from One Piece, but also features Bowser's first voiced role. And that was not the voice I was expecting. Anyway, Bowser's role in this is very similar to the first game, as he attempts to conquer the kingdom while turning everyone into objects. But one major difference between this animation and the game is that we see Bowser interested in marrying Princess Peach, which apparently would mark the very first time he's shown being in love with her. So if this animation brought any influence to the mainline games, it's that characterization where Bowser is trying to marry Princess Peach. Meanwhile, on the western side of things, we had all these cartoons made by a company called... Dick. The Mario franchise had three shows produced by Deke Entertainment, which had frequent appearances from Bowser himself, exploring his latest schemes. There was the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, followed up by the Adventures of Super Mario Bros. 3, and finally, the Super Mario World television series. And I think if you grew up around that time, you would have seen this show somewhere on TV, or if you're from the early 2000s, maybe you saw scenes from this show in a YouTube poop somewhere. Mama? Mama Luigi? <laughs> But the one in particular I want to cover is a totally different beast known as King Koopa's Cool Cartoons. This is 1k away from being racist. A live action show starring Bowser that aired for one season in late 1989. And yeah, they figured this would be a great idea. I'm surprised I haven't heard of many people who were scared of this thing, considering how terrible this costume looks. This show had a format that would start with a recorded introduction, followed by Bowser hosting in front of a live audience of kids. And I would talk a little bit about this intro, but I think that you need to see it for yourself. Why? Sometimes when I'm looking at anything from the early 90s, it feels like I'm peering into a different dimension. And I live through those times. Anyway, King Koopa here would spend the time reading fan mail and giving quizzes to viewers who would send their responses into the show through the mail. Surprisingly, the show had high ratings and viewership, but of course, ran into its fair share of hiccups. The first actor that played Koopa, Christopher Collins, started yelling at the children in the live audience that got into an altercation with his son, who was also present. On point characterization aside, he was fired and replaced with Pat Piney, or is this Penny? Penny. I'm gonna go with Penny. Which caused him to be heckled for not being the same actor by other children that joined the audience. Man, fuck them kids, bro. So as you can imagine, the show was pulled after one season as parents didn't seem to be big fans of it. There's an excellent video by Thomas Game Docs that came out recently discussing this show in more detail, that you should definitely check out if you want to hear more. But honestly, after talking about this show, the 1993 live action movie doesn't seem nearly as bad. And this cult classic could totally get a video of its own, but I need to talk about Dennis Hopper's version of the Koopa King. Larry Lazard of Lazard Lazard, Conda, Dactyl, and Cohen. So as you all know, this movie has nothing to do with the games aside from names and some themes from the games like the Mario Bros being plumbers, a princess existing, a King Koopa, and... If you're ever curious as to why Nintendo even let this happen, it's because Mario was so popular that they thought anything would stick. Yeah, essentially the producer of the film walked into Nintendo of America headquarters with a script and they were like, Hey, where's the freaking Gabagoo? Okay, sure, let's do it, as long as we get profits from the merch. Ah, ah. You motherfucker. 
I'm simplifying that story quite a bit, but the point is Nintendo really didn't care. And apparently, Oscar-winning screenwriter Barry Morrow wrote a script for the original concept for this movie that one of the co-producers scrapped since it was a more serious drama rather than a comedy. And I would love to peer into the dimension where that movie was released instead. So speaking of dimensions, the plot was actually about the Earth splitting into two different dimensions after the big meteor that crashed 65 million years ago. So one dimension is where dinosaurs thrived and the other is our world where mammals and eventually humans thrived. And Mario and Luigi are plumbers from Brooklyn, New York, and after a ton of exposition and meeting Princess Daisy who gets kidnapped, they pursue her through an interdimensional portal to the dinosaur version of Earth, ending up in a city called Dinohattan, which is a ridiculous name until you realize Dinohattan, Manhattan. <laughs> anyway, these brothers go through a ton of hijinks in this foreign dimension to save Daisy, who premiered in Super Mario Land for the Game Boy. Which is fine, I guess. It's not the biggest sin this movie committed. But let's talk about the man of the hour, King Koopa. The script for this movie is horrendous, but Dennis Hopper sells this role in a very typical 90s villain fashion. Oil. <sighs> Lethal. Stupid. He is absolutely nothing like the in-game Bowser, but to give him some credit, there wasn't much to go off of in 1993, because the latest game at the time was Super Mario World. But in the movie, his whole goal is to use a piece of the original meteor that split the dimensions to somehow merge them back together so he could rule both worlds. Now, humor me for a sec. How do you do that if they merge into one world though? If the two worlds merged, what would happen to Dinohattan and Manhattan? Would they implode on each other? Would one win out? Would that happen for the entire world? How would the Earth suddenly sustain twice the population? You're talking about a situation a hundred times worse than the Thanos snap, because Marvel doesn't even explore how bad everyone returning from that snap at one time might have been. But this is even harder to fathom, imagining two established worlds merging together like that. This Koopa guy has a few skills loose in my opinion, but how could you not love scenes like this? <laughs> <laughs> Goomba! Yeah. Walk tall! Be proud! Go Goomba! But I want your honest thoughts on this movie. Leave a comment if I should do a whole video about the Super Mario Bros. movie from 1993. Anyway, my children and adults, welcome to October Part 4, the final chapter. Expect some more Halloween-themed videos for the remainder of the month as we keep the spooks and ass-clenching scares going for the entire month of October. So throw some fireballs at that like button and show some love in the comments section. Until next time, the prophet has spoken.